Welcome to Exploring Possibilities, a show about holistic spirituality. I'm your hostess, Cheryl Sitz, and if you're just finding our show, be sure to check out our website at journeyofpossibilities.com. You'll find a whole library of past guests, many, many interesting shows there. You can also find us on iTunes and Stitcher, and if you do listen there, do me a favor and rate us as well so that other people can find our show, and if you subscribe, then you'll never miss an episode. We'll be introducing today's guest right after a word from our sponsors. Hi, this is Mario with Tech Life Balance, and I've been in the IT field for about 20 years. I have a big range of experience. I've worked with PCs, I've worked with servers, I've done online marketing strategies, I do websites, I even build online communities and help produce the podcast that you're listening to right now. I've actually been involved in IT so much that I got lost in all the technology and technology was taking over me. And I'm not saying to unplug or anything like that. What I'm saying is find a balance. I know I did. It took a traumatic event for me to learn that capability and it it was a challenge. And there are obstacles and there's things you run into that sometimes you don't realize you're even doing. So I designed a program to help you do that by looking at all your technologies and just helping you embrace it in a way that it's smooth into your life. And I like to say that we log in, log out, and break free so we can have life. Contact us at techlifebalance.net and let us know what we can help you with. Enjoy the podcast. Today's guest is Michael Tamura. He's a spiritual teacher, a visionary clairvoyant, and the award-winning author of You Are the Answer, Discovering and Fulfilling Your Soul's Purpose. Spiritually aware since childhood, he's helped thousands to heal, awaken, and find their true life purpose. Michael's been on CNN, NBC, Bridging Heaven and Earth, The Aware Show, Hay House Radio, Guyam TV, and ABC News with Peter Jennings. So you can imagine how excited I am to have him here with us today. You can also find him online at michaeltamora.com. Welcome, Michael. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me on your show, Cheryl. I'm excited to be here. Well, we're just delighted to have you. And there's so much to talk about in not very much time. I hardly know where to jump in. But I think I'd like to start by asking you about your childhood. I read on the website that you you ha- spent your childhood in Japan, but then you were educated in the U.S. schools and that you've been yes. awake since childhood. So what was all of that like? Well, um, when I was going through it, <laughs> <laughs> I was born in Japan, and but I was born on an American military base there because my father was in the army during the Korean War, and then he, uh, uh, when I when he got out of the army, then he continued to work for the U.S. government uh, on the U.S. military bases. So that's when I came along, and I grew up uh, all the way through graduating from high school in Japan, but I went to an American school on the military base. And so my education, my formal education was all in English and American education. And uh, at home, uh, my first spoken language was, of course, Japanese and in my neighborhood. But I spoke English when I was in school on the base. So it was like living, straddling to worlds and I loved that. That was one of my favorite parts about growing up in this kind of a bicultural setting and my parents were nominally um, Buddhists. Uh, Unlike being in some religion elsewhere in the world, Buddhism in Japan wasn't so much as a religion as much as a way of life. So people just, as far as the people I knew, they just lived it. They they didn't go to church or temple or something like that other than for, uh, in fact, the temples and things that I was taken to when I was little was Shinto uh, shrines, which Shinto is the Japanese national religion. And so it, it wasn't, very structured. It wasn't you go to church every Sunday or anything like that. And there wasn't a lot of communication about God or spirit or anything. It was just kind of the way you lived. And and when I was little, um, I even remember my mother before I was born. (laughs) I'm, I'm 
hanging out above her uh, body. And she was a little bit, uh, I, I think a lot of young mothers especially go through this when they're getting to term of their pregnancy, it's like, okay, I've had enough of this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just why don't you get out and, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm getting tired. So she's, she's in the hospital. Uh, again, this was a, a U.S. type of a hospital, American type of a hospital in Japan. And, and she's using this um, uh, for pregnant women uh, back then, it, it wasn't like button, you know, push button controlled uh, beds that hospital beds that go up and down and stuff like that. So, so she had to have this two step uh, stool thing, uh, like a stepping thing, to get onto the bed and off uh, more easily with her pregnancy. So she she takes this little step stool thing and uses it like a stairmaster. <laughs> And she's exercising. She's going up and down, up and down these steps, uh, going, okay, you know, baby, come on out. <laughs> come on out. <laughs> My mom was quite a fun person. It sounds yeah. like it. <laughs> yeah. So that's one of my early memories of, of waiting to come in. And, of course, the, the soul entering into an incarnation, a new incarnation, a birthing process – Different souls do it differently, but uh, I, I just can't imagine coming in before birth. <laughs> why, <laughs> why come in and go through this whole, you know, <laughs> narrow passage of being squeezed out <laughs> and, and have that experience when you could wait until the body's out and, and then you can come in much more easily to the body. And plus, when, when you're... A, a soul that's aware and you're coming into this baby body that really isn't equipped to do a whole lot. <laughs> it's, right. It's, it's not something we're going, okay, let's go in there, you know, guns loaded <laughs> and, and get the show on the road. You know, it's going to be quite a while before you can really get going. And, and this is the difference between, you know, the time when I was born 62 something years ago and and now the, the, the souls coming in, the really awake, more awake souls that are coming in now are coming in to, well, both there's much more difficulties as well as much more uh, permission and support for them to be awake. It's kind of a two edged sword. When I came in, there's very little. There's very little awareness in humanity, and I don't know. I, I don't think it would have mattered whether I came in through Japan or I came in through the United States or you know Europe or someplace. It's each one has its ups and downs. Uh, in my case, fortunately, I came in to a space where. It wasn't heavily religious, uh, you know, indoctrination or anything like that on the one hand. So I didn't get any of that. But on the other hand, there wasn't a lot of communication and validation about spirituality. So, so I come in and my first difficulty was I'm here to communicate. In fact, we're all here to communicate. That's, that's a fundamental aspect of our soul's purpose is to say hello, to, to learn to say hello first and to be able to say hello to everyone and everything uh, in your life. And that's what we're here to learn, as simple as that. Basically, in whatever language and whatever way and whatever form, to communicate, to be able to say hello and share who you are with one another. And so that's, I'm coming in and ready to teach. <laughs> as a being, you don't think of yourself as a baby. I mean, that's not, I don't think any soul coming in thinks of itself as a baby because as a soul, you're, you're not a baby. You, right. You're, you know, you're not, you don't even think of yourself as an adult. You just think of yourself as yourself. This is, I'm here, this is who I am, and, and let's get going. <laughs> but, but then, 
nobody communicates to you. You know, you're, I feel very lucky on the one hand because I was around kind and loving people. But even so, I mean, with the best of circumstances, you don't get a lot of communication as to recognition as to people seeing you for who you are as the soul that you are. They see a little baby. And in fact, I had a, my mother, before she died, she, uh, had some amazing uh, recollections and insights to things when I was born. Um, she was prepared by, I think it was around mm, seven months along, you know, when she was quite pregnant. And uh, my father was out to Tokyo looking for a job uh, after getting out of the army. And my mother was staying with her older sister and her husband, the older sister's husband, uh, who was a medical doctor, had a private practice. And they lived in Sendai, you know, of the tsunami and earthquake fame now. But uh, that's where I was born, in the city of Sendai. And anyway, my mom's sitting out one day, uh, very pregnant, on the back uh, open area of the house, and the young man who was the son of uh, her sister's landlord, uh, the person they were renting the house from next door, comes home from college for the weekend. And he's walking outside in the yard and looks over the fence and sees my mom sitting there. And he goes, oh, Mrs. Tamara, uh, uh, let me, just a minute. And he goes inside. He comes out with a deck of cards, he jumps over the fence and goes up to her and says, I have to give your baby a reading. And of course, my mom has, she didn't know what a reading was for one thing. <laughs> and and uh, so she's just going, okay, uh, whatever. And so he starts shuffling the cards and asks her to cut the cards and, and, and then he spreads out the uh, cards and and he says, well, uh, your, your baby is, is a boy, uh, very strong and healthy, and so uh, he's, he's great health and everything. And that, of course, my mom thought, wow, great, and made her very happy. And she said at the time, that's what she heard, and, and uh, uh, she was happy about that. That was the most important part of the reading for her. And, and then she said, but... He continued and he, he told her, and when your baby grows up, he's going to be a great healer and a teacher and a spiritual teacher. And he's going to be traveling all over the world, healing people and, and teaching. And my mom said at the time that just she heard it. She heard the words, but it didn't mean anything to her and just went flew right by her. And and so she said thank you to the to the young man and. And uh, he went back home, and she thought, "Oh, that was interesting. I'm ha I'm going to have a baby boy who's <laughs> who's strong and healthy. Great." So that that was her take on the reading, until oh, probably I would say some thirty eight years, forty years later, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm having lunch with her in in California. You know, after she she's moved over uh, with my dad to California. And during that lunchtime, she tells me the story and she says, and now she said, I finally got the rest of the reading. <laughs> <laughs> and this was after she had studied herself. You know, she took a, a lot of classes in psychic development and spiritual growth and um, was quite a very capable woman, very capable clairvoyant. And and so we were talking and then she said, yeah, uh, in the midst of all this and and she says, here, you've been teaching for all these years. And um, uh, she said, I finally connected the dots and, and realized what this young man was telling me before you were born, several months before you were born. And isn't that fun? And so, so she yeah. got a little uh, preparation from, from spirit. And so then she said, when I was born... Uh, back then, of course, uh, you're born in a hospital, and then as soon as you're born, you're taken away to the little cleaning state, you know, uh, away from ma mama and everything. Before, they don't give give the baby over to the mother right away. They they 
take care of the cord and everything and the nurse takes care of the baby and then when it's when the baby's all cleaned up and wrapped up and everything then she brings the baby to the mother to present the baby to the mother so there's there's this gap between being born and and being with your mom so she said that from her perspective when when the nurse brought me over to her <laughs> she, she said she had this fantasy and this expectation that a baby was going to be this cute little sherb like you know thing. <laughs> <laughs> and when when she she handed me over to to my mom she said she looked right into my eyes and i looked right back at her and she said oh my god you know, not only did I look like this shriveled up <laughs> something or other, uh, because I was a very small baby, <laughs> too, but she said there was nothing about me that fit this image of this cute, <laughs> cherubic like uh, uh, baby. She said, I was looking into the eyes of this really ancient old man. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> and she said she got scared. <laughs> <laughs> and she handed me right back to the nurse and says, okay, that's enough, and you can take him back now. <laughs> Isn't that great? That's I funny. mean, she, she had a good laugh, this, and, but this was 38, 40 years later, and we're laughing about it, and she says, yeah, it was, it was uh, strange. She said, it just right there and then, you know, it was like, I don't have a baby. And, and, uh, uh, that so was rather that was, fortuitous, wasn't it? Because yeah, you were an old soul coming back again. And I remember that, it, not not her reaction, but I remember uh, thinking to myself early, early on, once I started to bump into this, gee, people don't get what I'm saying. They, they don't understand anything. And, <laughs> and I finally came to a, a type of peace. It wasn't really a peace, but I came to a realization probably about four, five, six, maybe six years old or so, that, oh, I wasn't going to really be able to do what I came to do until I was an old man. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember thinking, I want to become an old man, you know, hurry up and become an old man. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> most people don't want to get old. But I wanted to get old, and I couldn't wait to get old. Uh and so that was that was my beginning is is just okay let's hurry up and grow up and get <laughs> up so so I could do what I'm here to do. But you know that brings up something really interesting about the season in our life when we're when we're to come into our own about whatever we came here to do. Doesn't that happen for a lot of us? I mean I have felt that before too like when am I going to get to the point in my life where I'm here to shine, you know, to really do yes. it feels like there's a, a period of waiting and all this development and and whatever. Yeah. It, yeah. So what do you what words of wisdom do you have to share with those of that get really impatient with that. Well, you know, you know this uh, the term uh, he or she's a late bloomer. Yeah. Well, you may notice if you look around in the world, and it's, this is just in America or Japan or any particular country all over the world, you'll see a bunch of late bloomers right now starting to bloom. And those are folks that are older, you know, middle age and older, perhaps, that are starting to wake up and starting to go, oh, I know what I'm here for. <laughs> or yeah. I need to do this. And and the reason for that, why at this time there's so many later later bloomers than <laughs> earlier bloomers, is that that um, uh, it it takes a lot of preparation. It's not just waiting. It's it's an enormous amount of preparation uh, to be able to do what we're here to do. So it's like um, you know, even even a, a soul like Mozart, who you know was a prodigy at three years old, writing you know symphonies and stuff that nobody's ever done before. Even souls like that, you still he still needed to take piano lessons you know he he still needed to to have teachers to to learn from and practice with and so forth and, and get some feedback from uh 
so even those with what what we call natural or or genius type uh, talents and whatnot, they still need to learn and they still need to prepare. Right. And so the more you have to to offer, sometimes it takes longer to prepare. So in my childhood, I I have I didn't know that okay, I have to learn how to manage being here as the spirit that I am. I have to learn the ways and means of of this world and 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 of relationship of how to relate to everybody and this is one of the things that happens especially to those of us who come to heal or teach or to guide or to lead in some way shape or form and there's a lot of us here in this world now and a lot more coming in but the those of us who've been here for a while and are kind of lately blooming <laughs> are are those who had to go through an enormous amount of training and preparation to get to the place where they could be heard where they could be seen and and understood because just by being yourself if you're just being yourself what i learned in my childhood is if i just was myself people i didn't understand that other people didn't have the same awareness as i did and they weren't being aware of what i was talking about so it didn't go anywhere right as, for example when i was really little four five six years old uh i was um uh, had the experience of i saw things in in geometrical progressions it's it's like the best way i could describe it is i would come around somebody and at the time I didn't know it but now in retrospect I would come around and, and kind of touch their aura if you will and uh, once I did that and that person had whether child or adult had something that I had to offer I, I have to offer uh, in terms of communication this geometrical configuration would pop up right between us like in 3D you know those uh, computer generated 3D grid like uh, very intricate drawings of uh, the engineers and stuff look at on, yeah. on the screen and they can turn it around and whether it's a car or a building or something it looks like this geodesic dome that's been morphed into something and it looked like that and um, when I saw that I would know what I needed to know about that person, what was going on, especially in their relationships with others. If it was a child, a lot of times their relationship with their parents and the family and what was what they needed to learn for their next step in their spiritual growth. If it was an adult, similarly, you know, what's going on in their lives right now and what's their next step. But being a four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old, I, I didn't have the life experience. I didn't have the vocabulary. I didn't have the no wherewithal to put it into language right. and, and explain anything, describe anything. And being the kid I was, I just said, oh, look. <laughs> <laughs> and physically with my hands, I would, I would point at this geometrical configuration between me and the other person uh, who needed to know this. And I said, okay, if you look at that, you'll know what you need to know to take your next step. <laughs> and uh, you can see, you know, that yeah. didn't go very far. <laughs> it just was like, I, I was, as far as their reaction, it was as if I was going, oh, you blah, 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 blah. right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I would be looking at you. Yeah. I, I don't, I have not, I understand from, Hans King, who is how we connected, which is so cool. I understand from from learning from him that basically we all have all of the gifts and we have developed whichever ones we've developed, but yes. we're all in the path of developing them. And I have not developed the clairvoyance that much. So all of this is very intriguing to me, but I'm sure that we have listeners that have some of this. And what is your what is your guidance to someone who's starting to see some of these things and have no idea how to process that? Well, uh, first and foremost, laugh a lot <laughs> it's it's enjoy it and, and when you take something seriously you're not going to go very far with it Perfect. and it's it's all for fun it's all for uh not entertainment it's it's all for enjoyment 
life is meant to be enjoyed. And and when we're joyous, when we're happy, at the, at the very least, we have to be happy with ourselves. That's a starting point. A lot of people think in life, happiness is a goal because there's so much unhappiness that people experience in life. They think, okay, if only I could get happy, you know, that, that would be a great goal in life to just be happy. Right. <laughs> but that's, that's not correct. If you, if you set happiness as a goal, you, you, I'm here and then happiness is way over there. And if I work at it hard enough and for a number of years, I might get happy if I do the right thing. That's, <laughs> you, you, we're never going to get happy that way. You have to realize happiness is within and you start with being happy. It's a choice. It's not, it's not some kind of a magical thing that happens to you if you do all the right things. No, happiness is a choice. You decide you're happy. And if you're happy with yourself, if you're happy with, you know, as, as things are, then you can start to understand and you can progress from there. Happiness is just the beginning. People don't realize because if you're not predominantly happy to start with, you think happiness is such a great place. But happiness is just the beginning. There's from from there. There's no limits. There's no there's no end to it. It just the joyousness of life is is always it's constant and always never changing. It's just that almost everybody tends to to blank themselves away from it. They they. They're kind of denying themselves of this incredible thing that they're completely, it's immersed in, around them, inside of them. But it's like a person walking around with their hands on their eyes going, gee, it's so dark in here. (laughs) (laughs) And so my job has always been to tap the person and says, wait a minute here, can I help you take your hands off of your eyes (laughs) so, so you can see? And and that's like pulling teeth. It's harder than pulling teeth. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. It's dark in here. No. If, if you just, you know, let go of your hands from your eyes, you could see that it's not dark. And it's that funny on one hand, but it's that difficult as well. It, it's, it's, it's only as difficult as a person makes it for him or herself. But the very first thing is... is being happy with yourself, even a little bit. And, and the very first step to being able to have that all the time is, is, oh, yes, I have a choice to either cry about this, laugh about this, get angry about this, resist this, fight this, or just go, oh, yeah, I, I don't have to take this so seriously. It's just, and fill in the blank, you know, yes. it's okay. I'm experiencing pain. Yes, but just because I'm experiencing pain doesn't mean I can't laugh. Just because I'm experiencing pain doesn't mean I can't be happy. Just because somebody insulted me and, and I experienced being angry uh, as, a, as a reaction to that insult doesn't mean I can't laugh at myself for getting angry at a stupid insult. <laughs> yes. You know, and that's a choice and it's a creative choice. And the minute we make that creative choice, to be happy, to be amused, to, to, to laugh a little bit about this, then we start to tap into that unlimited power we have within ourselves and we start to give ourselves permission to be the creative beingness that we are. To share ourselves, to allow ourselves to be who we are, we have to allow ourselves to express our creativity. If we don't, we... we we can't be and and we already are so if we're deciding i have to you know clam up and not say anything i i, I can't laugh I, I can't enjoy life then i'm putting myself into a box that doesn't exist and pretending that i don't exist and one of the things that i learned uh early on in in life was I constantly bump into other people's uh, limitations on, on themselves. And in the beginning, as a child, and being very, very psychic, being very sensitive, I would feast, feel, see, 
here know those limitations and so so thoroughly that I thought they were my limitations. Okay, I thought, like, for example, if I ran into somebody who was angry and I felt all that anger, I thought I was angry. Yes, I have some of that too. It's taking yeah. me, me a while to figure out, oh, that's not even mine. <laughs> exactly, and that's huge. And and everyone, especially the more aware and sensitive, more awake the soul is, this is one of the first things that soul has to learn is, oh, wait a minute, how much of what I'm feeling, how much of what I'm aware of in some way, shape, or form, especially those things that are not joyful, is really mine. How much of what I'm experiencing that's not loving, that's not kind and compassionate, isn't mine. It's where the person I'm tuning into is at. And that's how they're thinking about themselves. And we have a tendency to, to match where somebody else is at, make it our own, and interpret it as, oh, I don't like you. Instead of, oh, this person I ran into doesn't like himself. <laughs> this person I'm talking to is uh, uh, angry at himself. Oh, this person came from a funeral and they're, they're sad and, and they're grief-stricken about something and about a loss they feel they experience. But that's not where I am. And people get angry if I'm joyful when they're sad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as as I'm listening to you talk, I'm I'm I want to ask you about trauma because yes. how much of this relates to to a traumatic experience that we have years and years ago and we carry this trauma with us? How much of it is our reaction to what happened and how much of it, of it is everybody else's information about that and feelings about that and teachings about that and I mean, I kind of sense that that happens with trauma a lot, doesn't it? Yes. And you want, you want to hear something funny is if you take my last name, Tamura, and jumble it up, it spells trauma. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny? And, wow. and so uh, in a sense, that's for me, that's a reminder <laughs> that, oh, yeah, if you take trauma and you respell it, you know, you, you – uh, uh, Trauma is a is kind of like a misinterpretation of Tamura, <laughs> <laughs> and that's what what a whole big part of what people consider life to be. And when they decide this is trauma, oh, this is terrible, oh, this is so painful, and I'm suffering so much. That's that's what trauma is, right? When we say something was traumatic experience, right? It means we suffered to a greater degree than our normal suffering. <laughs> it's, it's on a day-to-day -day level. What I consider suffering is whenever someone's not happy, they're suffering. Right. So it doesn't, most people won't consider that suffering because they put suffering into a sliding scale and <laughs> they have degrees of suffering where Okay, when it hurts this much, beyond this much, that's called suffering. But if it hurts less than that, it's not suffering. <laughs> if I can handle it pretty well and, and go through the day, that's not suffering. That's normal. That's but, life, but, right? That's yeah, that's <laughs> life. Life is suffering. And, and so how many people live their lives unhappy wow. and don't even realize how much they're suffering? Because they have a good job. They, you know... They have a pretty good relationship or two or three and they have a you know good enough amount of money or something and they 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 go yeah hey you know it could be a lot worse and and i've had it a lot worse but so now it's comparatively better so it's it's all right <laughs> they're, they're settling for a, a lesser degree of suffering because they're afraid that if they let go of that they're going to they might have a bigger degree of suffering. <laughs> oh, it's ridiculous. <laughs> when you really think about it, it's, it's kind of insane. Yeah. So, so almost everybody I see, they're, 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 they're being complacent about suffering a little bit all the time. And why I'm a healer is, is 
a healer is is a soul that decides okay suffering is for the birds well not suffering's not even for the birds. <laughs> i wouldn't give it to we're the just birds. done with that right yes, be done with <laughs> suffering and and um uh so what what do we okay if we make suff- if we divide suffering because there's little suffering and big suffering and we divide it into okay <laughs> little suffering is not suffering but big suffering is suffering <laughs> and traumatic we can't ever heal ourselves yeah because we're saying this kind of suffering is okay and and we don't need to heal ourselves this kind of suffering is not okay and we we're going to fight it to the death well we're still we're going to be stuck in suffering if you do that god that's because huge Yes, suffering just means I'm divided against. If I'm suffering, if I'm uh, even putting the word suffering away, if I'm not happy yeah. at any given time, if I'm not happy, that's because I stop loving myself. I am divided against myself. And that is our cue. That's our cue. Oh, I need to heal myself. Okay, I need to become whole. Healing myself only means I've divided myself from wholeness and I need to restore myself to wholeness. So what's wholeness? Wholeness is limitless. Wholeness isn't something you could put in a container no matter how big the container. The, the container could be as big as the entire universe, but it's still a container. Wholeness doesn't fit into even a universe. Wholeness is unlimited. Wholeness is infinite. Wholeness can't have a beginning and an ending. Wholeness cannot be regulated by time. Time means, ah, you went from point A to point B, and now you experience a different time because you, you still remember an earlier time and so you're you're measuring everything time is is a measurement of two points passing each other and and when you keep on measuring like that then you live your whole life like kids in the back seat of a car <laughs> when are we going to get there <laughs> right it's, yeah it's, if you if you look into people walking around in the streets, especially in a busy city and everybody's going to work or coming from work or something about you know work and this and that, everybody's looking at their clocks or watches somehow, and they're being a slave to time. Yes. As long as we allow ourselves to be slaves to time, we're going to suffer because time <laughs> is division. Suffering is when we're divided from, we're separated from, isolated from the whole infinite eternity. And that eternity, there's no end to it. There's no beginning to it. So this is why people often say, oh, the eternal present, right here, right now, then you get to experience eternity. It's not right here, right now. It's just this particular nanosecond and that's it no if you're present right here right now ah you start to you start to reach out to or reach into eternity and when we start to learn to live in eternity we start to become masters of time not slaves to time and so I love what you're saying. I just want to ask you real quick because it's, you know, I can almost hear the people listening to this going, but, but we have to live in this world and we have to be at this place at this time and this place at this time. How do we blend living in this world in the conditions that we're born into with the timelessness of who we are? Yes, that's the key, isn't it? (laughs) Because if you look at it right from the beginning of uh, this incarnated physical life that we call our you know birth to death, just from the moment of birth, what are we doing? What is this thing called incarnating as as from the spiritual perspective as souls when we incarnate into these so called bodies what 's happening we 're going okay, here we are, these limitless eternal beings right. 
and we're trying to fit into a uh, very limited <laughs> container like bodies. And so even in very metaphysical spiritual circles, people talk about, I am in this body. That's not technically true. Right. We are beyond, we are in and beyond this body because if you, if you limit yourself to being this body and, and enclosed in a container, you can't be. The only way we can be is if we're timeless and there's no limits. We're not, we're not this physical body. We're not this mental body. We're not this emotional body. We're not a body at all. Which means we have to recognize what's the most basic body unit that this universe is made on are images. It's just mental images. And anytime, you know, some people will close their eyes and they, they see images, random images floating around. But when you remember things, you know, you go, oh, what did I have for breakfast? And, and you not only remember the smell of the toast or the eggs or whatever, but you see the, oh, oh yeah, I put ketchup on it or somebody had, you know, mayonnaise on it or whatever. You, you see those things in your mind's eye. Uh, as as memory, those are images, but our whole experience is based on these images that we create in our minds and when when we stare at those images, when we live in those images, we start to believe what 's contained in those images, the feelings, the thoughts, the energies the the whole experience of being in those images are true and real, but they 're not. As long as we're living in these images, we're going to be bound to time and we're going to be bound as bodies, things going through time. But the minute we start to experience ourselves as we are, these infinite beingness, then, ah, yes, I, I have lots of clocks. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And not only do I have clocks, I have to have, if I'm teaching uh, a seminar or anything, I have to have timekeepers. Right. Because otherwise, I would never stop. <laughs> People would pee in their pants because, <laughs> <laughs> because I skip the breaks. I, I forget there, there's things that, that you need you know, to have on a physical body level that called taking a break or moving <laughs> around or going to the bathroom. Right. And so uh, what I try to do is when I, before I teach uh, all day seminar, I drink a lot of tea and a lot of water. Then, <laughs> then I have to go to the bathroom. they will remind me, Oh yeah, we, we haven't had a break yet. Instead I love of it. Wondering why everybody in the class is on the floor with, you know, <laughs> foam coming out of their mouth. <laughs> And and so this is this is why some people seem to have so much more energy than other people because they're not bound by time. The more you're bound by time, the more you you give seniority to time. It's in this world. So you're you, talking about the aging process, all of it, right? When you're saying everything. time that we'd keep giving our power away to getting older to yes to yeah. If, if you're thinking, oh, you're getting older, then yes, definitely you're giving power to the time. Um, if you think, oh, no, I don't have enough time to do everything. How, how often, especially in this day and age, do people think, I just don't have time to deal with that? Yeah. Or, oh, that's too much. I just, I can't even handle doing what I'm doing already. Well, one of the things my teacher, Lewis, taught me a long time ago is he said, Michael, you know, you're going to be leading people and everything, and, and you, you're going to have to have people help you. You're going to have to assign jobs and projects and things to different people. And he says, when you do pick on somebody to do something, especially the more important things in your life that you need somebody else to take care of to do, make sure you pick on the busiest person to do it. And I thought, at first, you go, okay, wouldn't, wouldn't you normally think uh, you pick on the person who's, who's not doing anything to do it because they have all the time in their world? And the busy person doesn't have enough time to do what you need them to do, especially right. if you really need them to do it. 
And but I, I over over time, <laughs> over the years, <laughs> I start to really see his wisdom. Is and he told me he explained. He says because. The busy people are busy because they're the ones doing everything. <laughs> the people who are, who have a lot of time on their hands because they they're not, you know they're they're not busy is because they never do anything. <laughs> so if you ask those people who have a lot of time on their hands to do something, it's never going to get done. But you ask that busy person who's already got a hundred things they're doing, they're gonna and if they agree to it, they're gonna get it done. It's true. Isn't that fun? It's true. I, we, I've worked a lot with volunteers, and it seems like it's the same five volunteers that are running the whole county around here, you know? Exactly. It's, it's like, wow, they're everywhere. <laughs> yeah. and they're everywhere, and they're always doing everything. Right. And then the people you see sitting on the sidelines not doing anything, and, and usually they're the ones that complaining about, you know, the, the, the service isn't very good here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. And uh, whenever somebody complains to me about anything, I just say, great, hey, you must be very aware and capable that you can see there's a certain deficiency in, in this, so <laughs> why don't you go do it? I love it. Yeah, and then they stop complaining really fast. <laughs> Either they do it, and then they're happy they did it, or they stop complaining. Right. It's whether whether you realize okay in this world with physical things yes there are times and if if i don't show up on time for something that's scheduled then everybody misses out including myself so in the physical world we do have to we we do have to consider time but you never make it your master yes don't become and, don't become the illusion that we're in. Is that him? exactly? Yeah. So, for example, one specific example is back to the thing of having too many things to do, and and people talk about time management. Well, I, I don't bother with time management because it's not managing time. How, how can you manage something that's not really there? <laughs> that's why you could go to all the time management seminars in the universe and sure you know you might pick up a few techniques that helps you get more things done in a given amount of time but it's really not time management it's it's you recognizing time isn't real and so you don't put yourself into the containment of time the body could only be in one place at a time that's a given until you get to such mastery that you could you can bilocate or trilocate and you can have six bodies going on at the same time <laughs> in different parts of the world. I'm working on that. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? That would you know? be. <laughs> then you don't have to travel. <laughs> you don't have to get on a plane and pack clothes. <laughs> You're already there. So but in spirit you are. Everyone is. You don't it's not a matter of who's more capable or who's powerful and can do that. No. In spirit we are. We can be anywhere. All we have to do is put our attention and we are there. Because we already are and we're limitless. So in your thinking in this world, if we have, you know, 50 things we have to get done. Well, as far as some of those 50 things are going to require the body to be at a place and do certain physical activities to get it done. Great. We know that. We also know that the body could only be in one place at a time and do one thing at a time. So... Great, but that doesn't have to define who we are. The body's going to, you can schedule your body to be at this place at 9 o'clock and that place at 10 o'clock and that place at 11 o'clock and do these different things. Fine. But just because your body's only in one place doesn't mean you are only in one place. So when I have a ton of things to do, which is most of the time, <laughs> then... I don't, I don't put myself into little cubby holes and saying, okay, right now I am only doing this one thing. No, while I'm doing this one thing, I as spirit am already working on writing my next article. I'm already working on the next steps of packing my house so that we could move. I'm working on uh, cooking dinner tonight and so forth. So 
when my body gets to the next stage of, okay, first I'm, I'm right now, for example, I'm in this interview with you, body-wise. But that doesn't mean my whole beingness is having to stop doing anything, stop creating anything other than just this interview. No. If I did that, I would be stuck. If I did that, I, I, I wouldn't get much done. But so after this interview, on a time level and a physical body level, I'm not going to be sitting where I'm sitting. I might be sitting somewhere else or walking somewhere else or doing something else. But that, I'm just catching up to what I've already been creating in spirit. And so I do this where, say, I'm preparing for uh, giving a, a three-day retreat. I may be preparing for that for six months in spirit in terms of, of the curriculum, what, what I'm going to teach and how I'm going to bring it from the beginning to the end of, of that three-day retreat. But in the meantime, I'm not physically devoting my six months to just doing that. That would be ridiculous. I'm doing a lot of other things physically, but the physical part is, okay, I'm done with this thing. Now I'm going to take my body to, to start to f work on the physical part of the next thing, and then the body to the next part to do the next thing. So in my mind and in my awareness, all of these things are being done all at the same time. Everything I have to do in life is being done at the same time. But physically, I'm just taking my body to one thing, to the next thing, to the next thing. So it's, it's like, you know, in a hospital, a teaching hospital, you know how those teaching doctors have those uh, interns and residents and medical students following him around and while he goes on his rounds of all the different patients in the hospital, right? That's, that's kind of how I go about things is, is I already know there's, I have X number of patients, uh, and, and each one has certain situations and needs certain communication, certain treatment and everything. That all is happening at once. But physically, I could only go to one patient at a time and spend X number of minutes or hours with each person and, or each project or each thing that I'm doing in life. But in my mind, there's no division between all of that it's not like i'm only be able to do one thing at a time and when you when you think like that and when you live like that then you start to have a little bit of a taste of what it is to live in eternity in eternity there's no sequential process everything happens all at once and forever well, I wanted to ask you, as you're talking about this, I'm kind of getting some multidimensionality stuff, visions going on, too, of what you're talking about, because we do live yes. across dimensions, and we're not aware of all the dimensions that we exist in. And I wanted to meant to ask you about your five near-death experiences that I know that you're going to be writing a book about soon, right? And how, well, I, how that kind of played with I'm halfway written, and it's just sitting there after halfway. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and and it's been kind of brewing <laughs> the other half but yes well the five near death experiences it's uh one of the things well the first thing is not so much learning but confirmation of what i already knew that life is eternal and there is no time in spirit that's uh, that's a consistent thing that i experienced on in all five times is every time i'm totally out of the body and the body's knocked out and <laughs> not breathing and all that stuff. Uh, the minute I step out, and this might be somewhat different than some soul's experiences, but the minute I step out, there's not a single thought of my body in my, my mind. Uh, it's, it's, it just doesn't exist. <laughs> and so, and that's the experience when when you're done it's it's like there's no turning back there's no looking oh my god there's my body lying down on the ground or there's there's my body on the hospital bed or whatever it, it's who cares <laughs> <laughs> if i'm out of here i'm out of here 
<laughs> so it's like an outfit you took off and you don't need anymore. Yeah, it's just you're yeah. just done with and, it. And if somebody makes a, uh, you know, uh, some kind of a noise about that, it's it's like your mom saying, "Hey, why don't you pick up your dirty clothes <laughs> off the floor?" You know, <laughs> it's just, well, why should I? I'm not coming back. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> so anyway, it's like that. So it's you're in eternity. There's not a thought of time. And my experience in my what I call the biggest death experience was was when my uh, I was in the gym and and working out. I was in quite a good condition. I was working out. My heart stopped in the middle of doing my elliptical exercises in the gym. And and apparently my body collapsed, which I don't have a single clue about that. It for my experience of that one was just like being, uh, you know, those um, hydraulic tubes that you used to have where you put your your money or whatever into the tube in in this little container. It just goes. Choom, oh yeah, yeah. And it goes into the building or whatever. Uh, it felt like that. It was just like one minute I'm exercising and the next minute I'm being sucked out and my experience of where I was 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 like I've been taken to the furthest place in the universe, universe of universes as you can possibly go and and be in the center of everything. That's kind of my immediate experience. And there was not not even a glimmer of a thought of my body or death or anything like that and this is this was my third death and um uh, on the physical end probably the most dramatic you know uh, they had emts and people trying to trying to uh, the the first responder said my body was already in a, some kind of a premature rigor mortis and when they found me and wow and uh, and then they couldn't get the <laughs> ambulance service that was only like three or four blocks away from the gym to get there. <laughs> it took them over ten minutes to get there, and <laughs> but it was it was a comedy of errors and stuff in the physical world. And all this ruckus was happening there. None of that was in my reality. And as far as my experience was just being, well. It's this is the part that you know I haven't even come close to being able to talk about it in any kind of a sensible way because because there are no words there are no thoughts and in fact there's no me there's no Michael Tamura there's no person I can point at saying I experienced this so then once there's no relationship there's no consciousness there's just straight total beingness awareness and and it's about as profound of an experience of of huge but it's not a real experience experience like what we normally talk about experience because because there is no you experiencing something right like we're supposed to be the observer we're the ones observing ourselves and so without that self that you're observing then you're just the observer of it, you're just yeah. <laughs> there is no you. It's just right. the closest. Wow. You know, that's the point after and and all everything I'm saying is from after I came back to here, where I you know I can say me and I right. and, you know I have an identity type of a thing. But when I came back, one of the uh, when I came back and I start to be able to retain memory, which my wife says. For the first about six days, it took about six days uh, from the time of death to to afterwards, Mm -hmm. um, during which I had open heart surgery. They had me in medical coma and stuff like that. So six days later, I start to have memory, uh, you know, uh, where I could retain something for more than five minutes. Until then, she said she was quite concerned because, because she would tell me stuff and Within five minutes, I have no clue what that was. There's no memory whatsoever. And of course, during those first five to six days, uh, I wasn't here. Uh, I just had like a little tiny fingertip in in my body enough to say hi and say a few things and and then I'm back out again. But most of who I was or 
my beingness was was in this space and i would say that probably lasted in in physical time it lasted about 3 days the first 3 days after my death experience was was in this what i call the the term that i came up with was being in and with this eternal flame of god's love that's that's kind of the imagery that i can i conjured up of uh, closest to to what i what this whole thing was and and it was completely quiet completely thoughtless completely just and it's not blank <laughs> it's completely full and and wow. joyous and peaceful and everything everything it's just everything and and then after that then it became uh, kind of a re-entry process, and it seemed like a long re-entry process for me, where where I was being given this training uh, as a soul on how to come back this time, because the the earlier two deaths uh, when I came back, well, the first death when I came back was a complete rebirth, and and it felt like a rebirth. It was a rebirth. All my slate was completely cleared, and it was just like being reborn into a whole new lifetime uh, with just no strings attached. But then the third death was when I came back from that, I knew, and the last thing I was told is, when you're coming, when you get back, when you come back, you're, you're in the process of resurrecting yourself. I didn't understand it at that moment because I'm hearing this as I'm coming back. And then, of course, there's several, six days or so of no memory and this and that, the other thing. And then once I got back in enough to function uh, on a physical level, it took probably a good six months just to get back into, okay, I, I can do this thing. <laughs> so, wow. so it took a little while before I start to, remember okay oh yeah you're going back to resurrect yourself and i had to really start to look into what does resurrection mean it's the traditional definition is is raising up from the dead right and so over the course of the next i'd say two to three years after that was a intensive study of resurrection is okay what does it mean to raise myself up from the dead i'm in the physical world with this total different new awareness of life and i am going okay what's dead what what of myself is dead and i after about two three years of this search i started to recognize oh yes at one point, I was so, so, so sick. And it was a kind of a sick that I've never experienced before. Uh, on a chemical, bo body chemistry level, the closest anybody can get to was that my blood sugar and blood chemistry was completely off. And later on, uh, it was discovered that I had uh, pretty severe mercury toxicity. <laughs> who knows wow. where that came from but but uh uh it was it was a very very tough situation for about a year and uh and this was well i'd say three years yeah after about two to three years of of recovering and physically healing from all of this uh, we were talking about trauma, uh, physical type trauma of surgery, open heart surgery, all that, and being dead, heart stopping, all that kind of stuff. And and I gained my strength, and and I was in a pretty good shape. And once I start to get in this pretty good shape on a physical level, health level, then I really start to go through this resurrecting process. And in the middle of it came this about a six months of intense, really not knowing if I'm going to make it through the next minute type of a uh, experience. And when it got to the worst of the worst, I was traveling <laughs> in between events, teaching. And I'm in the hotel room, and I'm just, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm going to be able to 
make it through this. And then I thought, oh, yeah, there's a part inside that feels dead. You know the, that feeling when, when you've been sitting on your legs, you know, folded up underneath you, and then it completely falls asleep? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you touch it with your hand, and it feels like it doesn't belong to you, right? It, <laughs> yeah. It's like this lump of flesh that has weight and substance. But what is this? Oh, God. And sometimes <laughs> it scares you because it's like, oh, who, who's in bed with me? You know? <laughs> And it's like that, except not on a physical level. It was on a kind of an inner level. I came into contact with this part that seemed dead. Now, I think I've got the glimmer of resurrecting myself, from raising myself up from the dead, is this. is At least, if this isn't the only part, but at least I found one part of myself, inner part, that's that's been dead. And how long has it been dead? And of course, spirit never dies, but it can think it's dead. It's a part that I've divorced from myself. It's a part within myself. You know how when you blame yourself for something, uh, you can't stand uh, how stupid you were because you did something that was stupid and, and, and caused pain and so suffering and all that kind of stuff. And so when, when we blame ourselves like that, it's no different than pointing our finger at a specific individual. We're, we're thinking in our mind, that idiot over there did it to me, or that bastard did it to me. And, and we get angry and blame that particular person. Well, what we're doing in our own mind is creating an image of that person that's not real. It's not true. It's not who that person really is. But we decide it is, and we project our judgment and blame and guilt and anger and everything on this image of this person that we're so convinced that this person is the cause of my problems, my suffering, my pain. And we carry that around within us. But we could also do that to ourselves. We blame ourselves. We go, how could I possibly have done that? And and everyone does that in some way or another. If you go to that place of blaming yourself, and what in yourself are you blaming? You're isolating a certain part. You're not blaming your entire beingness because you don't, at that kind of a place where you're so uh, angry or so upset, you don't see yourself as a whole beingness. No, you're narrowing yourself down to this little tiny, tiny person uh, that has this incredible fault and incredible idiocy and, and failure and everything. And you're blaming this little tiny part of you that you isolate from the rest of the whole of you, your beingness, and you're, you're crucifying that person, that little person that you decide you are at that point, and nailing them to the wall, you're beating them uh, to, to a pulp within your own mind. And then you just leave them there. You are done. You're, you're, you're dead to me. It's, it's like that. And when we do that to anyone, we do it to ourselves. And that's the dead that I have to raise myself up from. So from that point on, a huge part of my personal growth, a huge part of my spiritual growth has been uh, resurrecting those finding and resurrecting those, what would you call it, spaces, areas within my own beingness and consciousness that I've in times past. And most of these I found to be times past, not even in this lifetime, but in way back prior lifetimes, way back, kind of like when you're, you're still going through your uh, incarnations as a barbaric, you know, uh, kill or be killed type of a, a consciousness. And, and uh, those are unfinished and unforgiven uh, areas within your own consciousness that you carry around over eons of time. And so, so as I would look to that, I would come across that, and every time I came across that, I would resurrect that part of my beingness out of this banishment that I put myself in. And, and as I did that, it was a profound, profound kind of a healing. Very difficult at first, but profound healing. And because these are things that you totally cannot intellectualize because, because these are areas that so 
buried, you don't even remember them. <laughs> and it's not even relatable from this, your, your memory of childhood or anything from this lifetime because it wasn't. It was from completely foreign cultures to where you are now and, and foreign times. And, and uh, it's, it's just like as if you're, you're resurrecting somebody else from the dead. And that's when I start to fully realize that, oh, it really doesn't – I've known this for all along, but, but it's different when you actually experience that, oh, yeah, what you do to somebody else, you do to yourself. What you do to yourself, you do to somebody else. It, there's no difference because these are places that are alien to your current consciousness and – and it's just as if you ran into a stranger who happens to be homeless or you ran into a stranger who happens to be a, a psychotic or you run into a stranger who happens to be uh, enraged or you run into a stranger who's so grief-stricken that they're inconsolable. And you, you don't recognize that as yourself. You, you, it's like a total – gee, who is – what is this? Who is this? But it's not until you recognize, oh, this too – is myself, what I've done to myself. And so those aspects, when I look at somebody yes. else and I don't relate to that as being a part of me, that's a part of me that I've, that I've cut off. Is that what yes. you're saying? Yes. That's the part of us that we isolate it from ourselves. Wow. From the whole of ourselves. And at the very beginning of this uh, interview, I mentioned that we incarnate every single one of us, our main lesson here that we're here to learn and that's every single one it doesn't matter how talented or how whatever uneducated or how poor or how wealthy anyone is in any lifetime we're here to learn how to say hello to one another why that is the fundamental healing we're here to look past the walls the barriers that we erect around our own so-called consciousness and identity to try to protect ourselves from each other. And we refuse to acknowledge, we refuse to say hello to another part of our own beingness. Spirit is one. There aren't a bunch of us spirits. <laughs> <laughs> There's just one of us. Yes. And, and if we can't say hello to each other, there is no healing. If you could look at, if we look at anybody, we refuse to forgive. You did it to me and I'm going to hold you to it. And until you, I see you pay and until you apologize five million times, whatever anybody decides, it doesn't matter. Apology doesn't matter. It, none of it matters. What matters for each and every one of us is to recognize, oh, I'm the one holding this against that part of my beingness. Yes. Because until I'm able to forgive that particular person that I hold in contempt, that I'm begrudging in some way, shape, or form, I can't resurrect that part of my own beingness, of spirit. That I is... can't re enter the heaven of eternity. I'm going to suffer as long as I hold it against that person. That is so powerful. I think that's a perfect place for us to start to conclude this interview. That is such a powerful message. We all have forgiveness work to do if we want to call it forgiveness, which you're right. It's just accepting those parts of ourself that we've become estranged from. Yes. It just means forgiving isn't trying to do something. It's, it's to re realize for yourself the truth. It's that simple. Beautiful. It's been such an honor to have you on the show today. And you I understand that we have a free gift that we're making available through a link that's going to be right on this podcast. And it's a basic spiritual toolkit. What can we find in there? Uh, it, you can find there just this very simple practice of grounding and how to run your energy and start finding your own space to be the spirit being that you are. So it's, it's our very, very most basic fundamental tools that we teach everyone that that this these are the set of tools that's required for anyone to learn anything more from us 
perfect. And then there's lots, lots more at micheltamora.com. And you've kind of also alluded to the fact that there's much more yet to come. So we're very excited about that. And thank you so much for all the work that you do and all the teaching and the sharing. You've certainly had an interesting soul's journey, <laughs> this this several set of lifetimes in one incarnation, <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you very much, Cheryl, for having me on your show. It was it was delightful to be on your show. And, and uh, I hope you do extraordinarily well getting this all this wisdom from all your guests and everybody to out there into the rest of the world. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you being here. Would you like to be a guest on Exploring Possibilities? Drop me a note at info at journeyofpossibilities.com. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time on Exploring Possibilities.